we've got a special prayer at the end today. We're praying for kids to go back to school before they get in here. We shouldn't cheer when they come in that they're going back to school. We're going to pray that they're going back to school. But can we just, parents in the room, can we just cheer they're going back to school this week? Woo! Hey, we are in the book of James. Open up your Bibles. James chapter 5. We start in verse 7. You're brand new. We're so glad you're here. We're closing out this series right now. And it's been a good series. We're going through a lot of uh, verses today. And really, it should be two or three messages. But we're starting a brand new series next week called Family Matters, uh, diving into just the importance of the nuclear family and the larger spiritual family, kind of, in, and ultimately tackling some topics as it relates to our culture today. So that'll be really fun as we start that next week. But today, we close chapter five, lots of verses. We're going to read a lot of verses today. And uh, here, here's what's cool about this kind of message. We do it every once in a while where we just are barreling through a ton of scriptures. And what happens is, is it speaks to different people in different ways, the, the spirit, which by the way can happen every week, right? I have people come up to me. This is one of my favorite things that happens and says, gosh, God just spoke to me and just start sharing an application of nothing I talked about. <laughs> it happens regularly. So God can teach share, encourage, challenge you about something I don't even say. And yet also today as we barrel through the end of James chapter 5, uh, y- what's really cool is the Spirit may say something radically different than, to you than the person next to you and challenge you or encourage you or, or kind of put something uh, in front of you that, that maybe you didn't even know was there. And so that's going to happen today all over the room. And I'm really excited about that. But I, I want to give you some context, See, even if you're brand new, because we're closing out a chapter and you may be like, what are we reading about? What is it? Why does it matter? And uh, what's the purpose of the author? And James is the brother of Jesus, and he's writing to the first group of Christians. Now, I want you to understand that Christians, as it is now, we, we have a really good framework for what that is. But in their day, Christians were called followers of the way, and, and the, the Jews thought they were a cult. And they thought that they were completely off base theologically, and so James is writing to encourage the, the followers of the way in a Jewish context, and they've gone through a famine, and so there's some, there's some physical challenges with that. The economy is not strong. The Tao is down, okay? And so within that, there's some persecution. There's also some challenges just culture-wide, and so James is writing to encourage them, uh, to challenge them. Um, and ultimately to make them stronger. And he says something seven times, seven times in the book. He says, you should be perfect. In some way, shape, or form, you should be perfect. Now, anybody else feel like that? That's a lot of pressure. Anybody else is like, listen, if you are calling me to be perfect, you don't know me. You're going to be disappointed because ultimately disappointment is directly correlated to your expectations. And if your expectation is that I am perfect, let me tell you in advance, you are going to be disappointed. And what's really interesting is in the Christian context over the last couple of decades, because of the pressure that the word perfect comes with, a lot of churches are trying to get away from that because they don't want to, they don't want to feel like it's condescending or condemning or, or just constantly re, being reminded, uh, every one of us, of, of that 3% we don't get right, even if we get the 97% wrong. Hey, anybody else good in the room of really lasering in on that 3% you didn't get right and not really, really celebrating that 97% of what you did well today? Well, that's why oftentimes we avoid that word perfect. But I'm going to tell you that James, when he uses the word, is really helpful. He means something different than we do. He means that as we place our faith in Jesus and the, and the cross of Christ and the resurrection of Christ transforms our lives, the goal from that point forward is for us to pursue wholeness. That's what that word perfect is translated into. In the Greek, it means to be whole. You want to be whole today. And in the fall, that there was a disruption, and we were no longer whole. We were no longer as we were designed to be. And so James's call and challenge to us is to pursue being whole. And yes, you are going to fall short, and yes, you're going to need the grace of God every, every step of the way. And as we lean into this, that that's the challenge today, is that you and I would mature in the faith by becoming more whole. 
right? Mentally whole, emotionally whole, spiritually through faith in Christ. We already have that promise locked in step, baby. You are whole. And the physical reality oftentimes is disconnected from that spiritual reality. And so how do we begin to align those things together? James chapter 5, verse 7. As we walk through this today, it's really important. Um, any gym rats in the room today? Anybody love the gym? Oh, yeah, I could tell. You're a bit buffer than me. Some gym rats, listen, you ever met the guy that, or girl that completely ignores leg day? It looks like all their life they worked out in the gym and never did their legs. Like the top is just beefy, muscly, wide frame, big muscles. You're like, oh, you can see the veins in the neck, and it's on little bitty toothpicks. <laughs> you, see, you seen that guy or girl at the gym? Oftentimes, that's what we are spiritually. So this per- pursuit of wholeness, this opportunity as we go through several uh, parts of the text, is we're going to figure out what day you skipped in the spiritual gym today. And maybe the Spirit will move and challenge you in a way to really grow that part of your faith journey. And as all of us do that together, the goal is that we, I think about my buddy's gym in Vista just down the street. He's got, he's got a big statement at the top of his gym. It says, soar tomorrow. Or sorry, soar today, strong tomorrow. And today we step in with the courage to say, hey, we we may have to get a little spiritually sore today in order, as the muscles tear, for us to be strong tomorrow. James chapter 5, verse 7 says this. Be patient. Just want to remind you, he doesn't say pray for patience because you all know what happens when you do that. Be patient then, brothers and sisters. I want you to pay attention to how many times that comes up in just the next three verses. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crops patiently, again, waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient, third time in just two verses. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Now, I want you to know, (laughs) near is different, right? I understand it's relative. This was written 2,000 years ago. (laughs) You know what they probably thought? Near wasn't 2,000 years. So the Lord's coming is near. And the relative reality of that is, hey, there's a mission to be had at hand, currently in real time happening to the ends of the earth. And yet until that day, just know the Lord is coming and it is near. There's an urgency as we follow Jesus. Like I think one of the things that, that our area in general and really America in general is we, we don't have a, an urgent enough faith. And then we need to be reminded that the Lord's coming is near. Verse 9, don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the store or at the door. It's, it's saying that sometimes we get impatient and in our impatience, we kind of take it out on each other, right? Any married people in the room today? Any, any, any married people in the room, sometimes you just got to look at each other and be like, uh, we're on the same team, right? Like we, we have the same bank account, we have the same kids, like that's your nose, my ears, like we're on the same team. And, and what, what that typically happens when you're not patient, when you're in a hurry, when you're rushed, when you're anxious, so all these things connected to this idea of be patient. That's why James says, not once, not twice, not three times. How many of you know when something gets repeated, the importance gets elevated? And so in relationships, not just in your homes, not just in your marriages, but spiritually, like at times when we, when we get an angst about our, our circumstance, when we get an angst about our trials, that can impact our relationships. It has a direct correlation. And so this invitation to say, listen, I, I know that things are hard, and I know that, that even you have questions about your relationship with the Lord, but I'm telling you, there's, there's a patience required as we go through this journey, knowing that the Lord is coming, knowing that heaven will be here, and there will be no more tears, and no more sorrow, and no more... But but that day is not today, and I'm going I'm to tell you that until that day comes, one thing's going to be required for you, and that thing is going to be patience, or one of the things required is going to be for you to be patient with each other. Because oftentimes, in our lack of patience or in our angst, we start to turn on one another. Verse 10, brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. 
As you know, we count it, uh, we count it as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance. Now, if you're brand new to the faith or brand new to Christianity, you may be like, well, that says job. And you're right. And so if you read that as job, so did I. But it, it's this, name, this guy named Job. And if you've been in the church, you know exactly who Job is because he, he kind of is the embodiment of, in the Christian faith, of somebody that goes through the worst of the worst. He has an entire book, chapters, of suffering. And the lesson in there is for how we deal with suffering, how we deal with the theology of suffering, how we deal with that that challenge that has forever been in the face of Christianity, that, that generation after generation has to answer the why question, which is if God is good and God is sovereign, then why is there evil in the world? And so many of us, including me, right, we can answer that in the classroom and then we walk through something. And even though we know the right theological answers, the weight of the trial is so great that it breaks our thin, fragmented theology. And here he invites us into that. And Job invites us, the story of Job invites us into that. And James reminds us of that. It says, here's the reminder, here's the reminder. Man, just because you're going through something, it, it, doesn't think, it doesn't mean that God thinks little of you. If you connect your trial right, to God's feeling about you, then you're going you're gonna to have the wrong application of faith. This invitation says he doesn't think little of you. He is making much of you, that he's shaping and molding you. And I know that doesn't always bring, it doesn't always bring like this comforting feeling. And, and I get that because I've been in the trial before when somebody's told me that. And while I believed it, it didn't change the angst. It didn't change the the weight, but it's just this reminder that how God feels about you is not directly correlated to what you're going through. And to prove it, to prove it, James begins to say, think about Job. He, He could have said, think about Jesus. But you show me a character, you show me a hero of faith, and I'll show you a trial. You show me a hero of faith that has a Uh, an incredible impact for the kingdom of God, and I'll show you somebody that faced an enormous amount of struggle. Our Savior, of course, at the center of it all. So this reminder that our faith will include trials, and I would just say this, that if you're out there and listening to sermons online and you ever hear a principle that's disconnected from that truth, then it's probably bad theology, because if the heroes of the faith can go through struggles, and yet the theological point is if you place your faith in Christ and that life is just going to be easy, then there's a disconnect there. And those are probably people that we shouldn't be leaning into. Brothers and sisters, an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count it as blessed those who have persevered. You've heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally, maybe, maybe in this moment, you want to circle, highlight, underline, What? Finally. Just as a reminder that what you're in feels like a long time. What you're in is not happening as fast as you want it to. What you're in, right, feels so overwhelming, so intense, but there is this final reality that is promised to you that through Jesus, what he conquered on the cross, what he conquered in the resurrection, there is a finally, praise God for that, what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. I love that he ends this portion of the scripture with the Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Because isn't that what what the why questions that we ask in the middle of the storm are all about? Are you really compassionate? Are you really as empathetic as you say? Do you really even care? Are you even up there? Are you even listening? Are you even answering any believer that lives in authentic faith has been in that moment where there's there's, there's the truth that you learn about on church on a Sunday or in a small group or you read about in the text and then you're in your moment and you're praying and and, and oftentimes it's not even for you. You're praying for somebody else and you're like, are are you even there? Or, Or maybe you've concluded that he's there, but you're not so sure he's good. Man, I've been there. And maybe you're there right now in this moment today. 
And I just come back, and I'm telling you, I'm telling you that maybe today is about believing something that you know to be true, but you don't feel to be true. Let me read it again. And maybe for you, you just close your eyes and you need to believe this today. The Lord is full, listen to me, of compassion and mercy. Sometimes it's hard to learn the lessons that are available to us in the midst of a trial when we put God on trial. That in our doubt, which is normal, which is human nature, but in that moment, there's, a, there's an opportunity, there's a question about where you go from there. We see in the Psalms that David, David doesn't avoid this moment. We see with other, uh, we see with Paul, we see with Peter, we see with so many of the heroes of the faith in this moment. It's not that they don't have these moments, it's where they go from here. In your doubt, in your struggle, in your pain, in your questions, right? Do those lead to a place where the enemy is able to convince you that away from God is, is where you should go because ultimately you can't trust him anymore or in the middle of it is he invited in as an opportunity to do whatever it is that he would do and even when the invitation comes for him to come in and the timing is not what you want it to be, you continually invite him in because you know that the only hope in the middle of whatever it is that you're in is if he's there too. Finally, believing, believing again that the Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Spiritual character cannot be learned just solely in a classroom. I, I can't teach you just from this conversation about the character that you need to have as you follow Jesus. Because part of the process is the struggles that you and I will go through on this side of heaven. And the promise is that, is that you go through it, he will be with you and identify with you because he went through it too. What God in any other faith goes through suffering like our God? It's what separates us from everybody else. And so the beauty of Christianity, the beauty of the gospel is that it's not that you won't face struggle, it's not that you won't face trial, it's that in the middle of it, he will be there if the invitation is sent. And then he will comfort you, and he'll be faithful to you, and he promises for you to have a finally moment. Verse 12. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not Swear, do not nudge your spouse who sweared on the way in here as they were cut off on the way to church. That's not what he means here. Now are you saying, you give me license to use four-letter words? I am not. But that is not what he's talking about. Above all else, my brothers and sisters, do not swear. Not by heaven or by earth or anything else. You see what he's talking about? He's connecting it to not using the Lord's name in vain. And you and I think that's stubbing our toe and saying, but actually, a, a more powerful understanding of this is that when we say, hey, hey, we're going to grab the Lord's name or our mom's cat's ancestors or, or whatever it is that we promise on, right? We, we go, hey, you need to trust me on this. I promise you I will. And they're looking at us, and we can tell they don't believe us, and we don't really know why. And then we start to think about our, the history in our relationship. We're like, oh, I know why he doesn't trust us, because I'm sketchy. That's why. And so I've got to add something. I've got to double down. And so I promise on my sister's cat's ancestors that I will do what I'm saying I'm going to do. And the Bible says, nope, don't do that. When you speak as a believer, your yes is yes and your no is no. Hard stop, period. You're like, yeah, but they don't trust me. And I say, do the work for them to trust you again then. And that's gonna take longer than you want it to. And that's gonna, that's, that's gonna take probably more frustration than you're ready for. But I'm telling you that trust takes a long time to build and it takes a very quick moment to lose. And I'm telling you that you and I need to do the hard work as believers to build that back 
up. Our yes is yes and our no is no. And there may come a time in that relationship where they are viewing you as your old self and you have, you have for a length of time proven that you can be trustworthy and they're still holding you to your past. They're still holding you to an identity that doesn't represent you now. And, and there may be a conversation where you prayerfully and gracefully remind them that you're not the same person anymore. But be willing to do the work. And the work is proportionate to what you destroyed. The greater the trust that you broke, the harder the work that you're going to have to, to and, and oftentimes the longer the work that you're going to have to go through to build that trust back up. Be patient. Be patient. Be patient. Then he goes on to say two times, persevere. Persevere. Interesting. You would think that this has nothing to do, nothing to do with building back trust, but that's exactly a perfect background to this conversation. Let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. Have you disappointed people? I'm sure you have. Welcome to the club. But do the work. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Don't slap God, his perfect and holy name, on a promise that you can't guarantee to fulfill. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Verse 13. Is any one of you among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Any among you sick? Let them call on the elders to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. Did you notice that? In this room today, there are people in trouble. There are people happy, and there are people sick. We're all over the room today. There are people in trouble. There are people happy, and there are people sick. That's the reality of the world that we live in. And church is coming together saying, we all have something, we all have some work to do this Sunday. For those that are, that are in trouble, let, let's pray about that. Every, every service we have prayer at the end of our service. Every week we have a prayer team that prays and contends for you. We also sing songs. Those songs are typically lifting up the name of the Lord, right? Some people in the room sing those because they are ready to praise God for what he's doing in their life. And some of us are praying to believe the songs that we're singing. And then he says, and, and for those who are newer to the faith, this, this could be weird. I, I'm going to be honest with you. When I was uh, brand new to Christianity, particularly ministry, I always, I always had a little bit of a, an uncomfortable feeling with this idea of anointing oil. It felt, well, I'm going to be honest, it felt kind of cultish. But I, I can tell you that, that in the life of our church, in the life of our ministry, there are, there are times, and we don't do it every time, but there are times when, when we will call on the leaders of our church to pray over somebody and beg God for healing. No, knowing, knowing that spiritual healing is available in a moment's notice, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, and you will be his, and he will be yours, and heaven is waiting for you, but, but also the physical reality, knowing that God cares about us mentally, emotionally, physically, not just spiritually, that God cares about our whole being, be perfect, be whole, he cares about our whole being, and this invitation for us to pray and beg and ask the great healer to heal, and have the courage and faith to believe that if in his will he would do that, he can and he will, and sometimes he does. That's the invitation of the scriptures today. That's the invitation for us to trust and depend on God. And our culture seems to, seems to struggle with that. And a lot of that is because we depend far, far more on the smartest guy in the room than we do on the one who created that guy. What I mean is when we sick, when we're, and listen, I'm all for this. My wife went through uh, cancer and we, she got chemotherapy she got a double mastectomy, and she got 30 rounds of radiation. So don't hear me saying that we don't believe in that. We, and you know what we also did? We did the Western medicine. We also did some Eastern medicine. If there was Northern medicine, we would have done that. And if there was Southern medicine, we would have done that. We were going to do anything and everything, right? And we believe heaven's waiting, and we believe that's the goal, and we believe that's where we belong. And yet also, we also wanted right, our, to grow old together, and we also wanted to raise our kids together. And so don't, don't hear me saying anything other than I think at times we depend far more on what humans can do than what God can do. 
And what I'm saying is that believers in faith is that we invite a healing God into the place where we are, and then from there, with wisdom, begin to seek out solutions that are available to us that haven't been available to us in previous generations. It's a both and, friends. So this moment in time is for us to realize that, that our faith may be strained, but here James is inviting us to put God at the center of it all. Verse 15, and the prayer offered in faith will make a sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. Now verse 15 is a really important thing that we dissect because oftentimes, and I'll, I'll tell you this, at camps I would share Lauren's cancer journey and I would share it boldly and I would share that God healed her and we believe that even though it was through the process of of Western and Eastern medicine combined. Um, and I had a young lady come up to me after one of my messages at camp, and she said, hey, just be careful with your story. And I'm like, what, what do you mean? She said, I, uh, my mom also did chemo and also did radiation and also had a surgery. And we also prayed, and we also came together as a church, and we also anointed with oil but we didn't get the same result. And you wrestle in that moment, right? Because what you don't want is for that truth to lead to a lack of faith. And yet at the same time, watch this tension, you don't want for us to have a faith that damages other people when they don't get the expected results. You feel, you're tracking me on that? And you go, what do we do with that? I had another friend um, whose brother's son passed away, and he had somebody tell them, uh, uh, somebody said that it was because he didn't have enough faith. You understand how that's not helpful? And so we're, we're, we're plenty smart enough to understand that God is a healer, and we believe in faith that he's a healer, but we believe heaven is our home. And, and what God does with that, and, and, and it, oftentimes it, it, we, we will never have all of the answers to all of the questions until we get there, but we believe and we hold on to that. That is a promise, but we also believe that God cares about us physically and he can step into the moment, and that, that moment is when we believe that he can do that, and yet at the same time leave the will of what happens up to him. That's trust. That's faith. That's real faith. And the prayer often in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, interesting connection. If they have sinned, they will be what? Forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. Another mention of healing there. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Interesting that the, the connection there is, is that you and I would, would confess to each other. So we have this opportunity to bring God into our sin, and he says, you'll be forgiven. But he says, then confess your sins to each other, and you will be what? Healed. It's almost as if confession to God is the surgery, and confession to one another is the physical therapy. That we would offer forgiveness or a reset on whatever it is that we've gotten ourselves into, that we would step out of the darkness and into the light, and as a result of that, we would be forgiven. Heaven says, hey, it's already paid for, baby. Paid in full. It's not Jesus plus. It's not Jesus and. You know, you got Disney plus, ESPN plus. You don't need Jesus plus. And it ain't $6.99 and they ain't doubling their prices this weekend. Jesus doesn't do that either. It's Jesus and nothing else. And that is forgiveness. That's the reset. And you go, it's just one surgery. And I'm no, welcome to daily surgery, baby. Welcome to open heart surgery every day for the rest of your life spiritually. And in that moment, there's a reset, a refresh, a redemptive reality that comes from heaven into that moment that says, hey, now you're on pursuit to becoming whole, who you were designed to be, who God made you to be, his imago Dei, his representatives here on earth, to take care of the land and to, and to represent me to a broken world. But you have to have the courage 
to confess your sins. And I'm not talking about, you ever been in a church where the, the pastor always talks about the sin from seven years ago that was really small and he's gonna tell you about it because it's real authentic to talk about a sin. It's like, no, I'm talking about the sins from this morning, people. I know on the way here, right? When, when, when your angst really got to the level because your kid, you, even though he's got seven pairs of shoes, can't find any one of them, and he's got one shoe on, and he's got his socks in his hand, and you're already late for church. You don't want to be the people that are late for church. Everybody's like, I don't know. There's Regina again. She's late. And uh, does she even care about Jesus? She shows up like that. Everything, you know? And you're worried about that, and you're like, ah, oh, get your shoe. I'm just, hypothetically, I'm not saying this happens in my house. I'm just saying it's a hypothetical situation. And that angst goes, and then you and your, you and your spouse are at it, right? And, and you, but as soon as you pull in the park, you're like, you know what? You, you, hey, at church, how's it going? Good? How about you guys? We are so good, right? And, and you're rubbing her back, and she's, I'm talking about that. That's what I'm talking about. Like, that happened this morning. If that's you, welcome home, baby. You're in the right place. You're in the right place. Get off me. But in that moment, there's this insane courage to say, hey, will, will we have the ability to talk about what's really going on? If you don't, forgiveness is available. Healing is not. Because healing comes through confession to one another. I believe that grace is powerful enough to move into the spaces of your life where you wake up every day the next day with that habitual sin. You may be in a habitual sin. You may be, your frustration about why you can't get over it is because you're including God, but not God's people. And so you keep getting surgery, but you don't go through the physical therapy. So this, and, and trust me, I've been in this place where I picked the wrong one to confess to. If that's you, and the reason that you're, you're struggling to open about, up about what's really going on, I'm just saying, don't let that ever hold you back. Don't let one knucklehead from the past keep you from your healing journey that is an invitation in the scriptures right now to confess, right? Confess your sins to one another so that you may be healed. Listen, the enemy wants you to think, and there are some people that this happens with. I'm not saying they're not out there, but the enemy wants you to think that if, you can, if people really knew they would love you less, my experience is the exact opposite. That when I pick people who genuinely love God and genuinely love me, who aren't in a religious competition, but who are genuinely trying to pursue wholeness, baked in grace, marinated in mercy, when I confess honestly to them about what's going on in my life, the healing process begins. So this opportunity for vertical forgiveness, but also for healing as we confess our sins to one another. He goes into another example. Elijah was a human being even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. My friends, Dustin Hoffman was not the original rain man. Elijah was. One other person in Scripture had control of the weather. Don't you wish that it was you in June of this year? Can you imagine having the faith the power to change. Like you can open your app in the morning and be like, whew, oh, the community's a little high, honestly. Uh, bill, my electric bill's a little high. I would like to not use AC. Lord, I just pray that you would make it 62 today. That'd be great. And you walk out and you're like, ha, huh, clouds are coming, baby. You and me, what's up, G? <laughs> That's the kind of faith that Elijah had. That's the kind of power he had because of his faith. And, and yet it's also a, a Polaroid picture of what was to come. That the prophets all had a characteristic of Jesus. Jesus would come and be the fulfillment of all the prophets. And, and he's, he's the one that we worship. He's the one whose name is lifted up above all the other names. But Elijah had faith. You want, to know how to, you want to know how to have faith? Read Elijah's story. I gave, you the, I gave you the reference there on your notes. You want to know how to deal with persecution and, persever and develop perseverance in the light of struggles? Read the book of Job. We get examples all over the scriptures for whatever it is that we're going through. And yet here's the example to say, listen, Elijah was a human being. Don't get it twisted. Flesh like you have flesh. Tears like you have tears. 
Hair like you have hair like I don't have hair. He was a human being. Verse 18, and he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their ways will save them from death and cover over. Yeah, maybe, maybe that's one you circle, circle there. Cover over a multitude of sins. Anybody need some sins to get covered over, baby? I don't mean sweep under the rug or covered over. I mean like genuinely covered, baby. You're like, why are you a pastor? Because of this verse. Because I need some sins to cover up. And I jo- I'm joking, but at the same time, that, that's true. That when you think, think about what that verse is saying, what that verse is saying is like, I don't care what you've done in the past. What I care is that your faith is in me and that I and you are going to work together towards a new future. Your, fa- your past will not define you. My, my, my love is going to define you. Your life won't be marked by what people think of you yesterday. Your life will be marked eternally by where you're going and what you're going to do from this moment forward. That's what it's going to be defined by. In fact, the greater distance that your past has from who you are now only screams all the more of who he is. This happens to me all the time. I planted a church in my backyard. I, we started our church where I went to high school. Okay? And story after story after story comes up. When people come in, my 20-year reunion, I almost didn't go. Do you know why? Because I didn't want to hear 45 times, you're a pastor? <laughs> over and over and over again. There's a gal that's been going to our church for, um, I'm not going to say her name, but a little over a year. We went to high school together. And I, 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 I remember her, but, but, but not v- super well. And she came up to me one time. She said, do you, do you know our only interaction in high school? I'm starting to get nervous. <laughs> no. <laughs> I said, no, I don't. She had our only interaction in high school. I was eating an ice cream. You walked up, you hit the ice cream in my face, and you walked away. (laughs) Remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their ways will cover over a multitude of sins. You know what she said to me in that moment? She goes, and I picked you as my pastor and walked away. (laughs) So I'm telling you, Grace is in this room. Grace is in this room from you up. Grace is in this room from me right, to you, from us to one another. Grace all over this place. May we be a place of grace because we all need it. May it define us. May it shape how we view one another. May it shape how we treat, each other, treat one another. And may, may it redefine us, not by what we've done, by what Jesus has done for us and what he is doing in us and what he is capable of doing through us. May that be what shapes us. A couple fill in the blanks, and then I'll close with a story. Ben, you guys can uh, start to get ready. Number one, if you're taking notes, going all the way back to the beginning, faith requires patience and perseverance. Faith requires patience and perseverance. We need to develop both. Remember, he begins the text with that beautiful and insane verse that says to consider it pure joy, which feels like he's saying, be a little crazy. Consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds, not because the trial is great, but because God is at work in the middle of it. Faith requires patience and perseverance. Number two, God's character is full of compassion and mercy. Maybe your takeaway today is just to pray for that to be true in your heart today. Number three, a Christian's word, I'm sorry, a Christian should be a person of their word. May we be the most trustworthy people where we go, with who we interact with. May somebody decline to agree with your faith and maybe even mock your faith, but when it comes to what you say, they trust you. And that, may that be the bedrock of a conversation about who Jesus is. A Christian should be a person of the word. I gave you a couple um, references there uh, for the 
characters we looked at just briefly. Jump down to verse, or fill in the blank four. Our spiritual journeys are built for one another. Prove that in verse, or, or fill in the blank number five. Admitting your mistakes, confessing sin is part of the healing process. The amount of one another's that shows up in scripture. I don't know the number off the top of my head. Maybe you do. Maybe you've heard that sermon. But the, the amount of one another's that are, that's in scripture. Man, when you were built from community, for community. The, the verse that describes that you and I were made describes us as very good, but it also begins with God saying, let us made from a triune God in community with himself. And if we're his imago Dei, that means that we are also built for community. Introvert in the room, listen to me. You are built for community. You're supposed to be in the lives of one another. And I know people have hurt you, and I know that, that you're hesitant to, to dive in. And I'm just telling you, that don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, man. Let God redeem and restore you into community and trust once again. Love is possible on the other side. People can be different in different environments. God wants to bring you into community today. Part of that is admitting mistakes and confessing sins. My closing illustration will be about that. Number six. Righteous prayer has legitimate power. Maybe it should be said this way. A righteous person's prayer has legitimate power. If you can find somebody who is wise, find somebody who is righteous, and they pray for you genuinely, not just like, oh, I'll pray for you, and then no one ever does. At our church, we like to say, I'll pray for you. No, actually, I'm going to pray for you right now, because we all know how that goes. If We just say, I'll pray for you. If you say it in passing as a social, like, just accommodation, then it means nothing. But if you mean it, it may be the most powerful thing you can do for the person. Why? Because a righteous person's prayer is, has legitimate power. And number seven is that you are an evangelist. The beginning is that you need to be patient. And then he goes from patience to you need to persevere. And, and then it's, hey, you need to participate in, in the community, and you need to confess your sins, and you talk about your life, and you need to bring people into it, and you need God's forgiveness daily. And, 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 and through all of that, he says, listen, when, when you start to step into that and lean into that, don't be surprised if God starts to use your life. And I'm telling you, when God starts to use your life, I want to remind you, right, that's, that's who you were designed to be. That's who you're made to be. You're not defined by your past anymore. You're defined by what I'm doing actively right now. So be patient and persevere. But watch what I'll do in the middle of it. Watch what I'll do with your life. And you're like, listen, every time Jesus comes up, my palms get sweaty, my knees get weeps, mom's spaghetti, and I run away. And that may be you. And I'm just telling you from the, from the biggest extrovert in the room, from the, from the biggest introvert in the room, from the biggest sinner in the room, to the person that generally makes good choices, wherever you're at on the spectrum, I'm telling you the same thing. You are an evangelist. Your story matters. You can go places I can't go. You can be effective in places that our staff can't be effective. You're an evangelist. God wants to use your story connected to his story to change somebody else's story. The part of it is us taking part in our own faith journey. Because that is the testimony. Years ago, I led a college ministry called Jacob's Well. And uh, we were walking through the Lord's Prayer. And I was crazy and young and had a faith that probably was built in a lot of naivety, but I had an idea that we were just going to confess. We were like 50, 60 college students. I'm like, we're going to confess sins, all of us, in the big room. And I remember our team was like, no, they're not. Definitely not going to do that. We start walking through the Lord's Prayer, and each portion of the Lord's Prayer had an activity, right? In the names of God, hallowed be thy name. And we got to the part about confessing sin, and I just said on the microphone, I just said, and right now, I'm going to walk away from this microphone, and it's going to just stay up here, and you're going to come up here, and whatever the Lord puts on your heart to confess, don't confess like something from years ago. I mean, stuff that you're actively in right now. Start confessing sins to one another because there is healing available as a result of your courage. And it may just take you 30 seconds of insane courage, but you're going to say yes. You're going to walk up to the microphone. You're going to start confessing sins, and you're going to see what God will do with your courage. I went and sat down. 15 seconds goes by, 30 seconds goes by. It's like, all right, I'm going to have to start making up some sins just to get this party started, you know what I mean? 
45 seconds. Just under the minute mark. The most socially awkward girl in the entire college group starts making her way from the front, and she's in the back. And she's not trying to go around chairs. She's going through them. <coughs> and you can already see her welling up with tears, and she gets to the microphone, and she just can barely keep herself together. And she confesses the smallest thing imaginable, but she's overwhelmed. She's been smoking cigarettes before and after group. For whatever reason, she just felt really convicted by that. She starts describing the temple and just feels like she's abusing it. But it's her courage. It's her courage to walk to the front that she gets healing. But watch this. It's also an invitation for everybody else to experience healing too. What happens in that moment is one of the greatest days of ministry I've ever had in my life. Alcoholics coming up and sharing that they've been drinking in their closet and nobody knows. Women confessing they don't like the way they look and they don't feel beautiful and it's impacting every, everything that they're doing, everywhere that they're going, every relationship that they have. Sin over and over and over again. Personal sin. Guys confessing porn addictions. And I'm telling you, that began to shape the ministry. It was never the same after that because one girl had the courage to say, I believe in what James is saying. So may we be a people of grace and courage, of faith and hope that as we develop our patience and perseverance, God would use it for the kingdom that he has promised to us. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you in this moment. We ask that you would meet us here. Spirit of God, meet us here in this moment. Move in this room. Encourage. Challenge. God, every one of us needs one point of application that we can take away and not just say, what a great moment for me, but says, man, this is going to be a moment in time that changes. Forgiveness is available to me. Healing is available to me. I'm leaning into it. I invite you there because ultimately it's only available to us because you're invited to it. The healer, the forgiver. Thank you for who you are and the work that you do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.